Um, so I'd like to introduce to you our lecturer today, Jesse Hagopian. He teaches history and is the co-advisor to the Black Student Union at Garfield High School, the site of the historic boycott of the MAP test in 2013. If you heard about standardized testing, that would sound familiar to you. Jesse is the associate editor for the social justice periodical Rethinking Schools and, and is also the editor of More Than a Score, the new uprising against high-stake testing. He is the founding men member of Social Equality Educators and a recipient of the 2012 Abe Keller Foundation Award for Excellence and Innovation in Peace Education and won the 2013 Secondary School Teacher of the Year Award and the Special Achievement Courageous Leadership Award from the Academy of Education Arts and Sciences. In 2015, Jesse received the Seattle King County NAACP Service Award, was named as an Education Fellow to the Progressive Magazine, as well as a Cultural Freedom Fellow for the Lannan Foundation for his nationally recognized work in promoting critical thinking and opposing high High stakes testing. Just want to get that right. Jesse is an activist, public speaker, author, and so much more. Literally, his biography is super, super long. Um, there are so many great things that I read about Jesse on his website. You Google his name, there's like a bazillion things that come up. So he is doing good work. Um, he is doing very meaningful work and. People are talking about what he's doing and sharing it through various different media sources, not just one single media platform here locally or nationally. So I encourage you to, to look him up after this lecture to learn more about him, the work that he does. But we are so privileged today to have him join us right here, right now, and to share that with us today. So Jesse, welcome to our community. It is wonderful to be with you all today because today is no day to be alone, am I right? Yeah. To, today is no a day to, to suffer in, in fear and silence alone. Um, and it's great to be with a group of young people to talk about how to resist and how to fight back. And although if you get up and, and walk out at any point, I won't be offended. I know there's Lots of walkouts happening, including at my own school today, so I'll take that as a sign of joining the movement. But um, I want to say that uh, we, we're going to have a great conversation today about the fact that, you know, many times you hear that Donald Trump's uh, election means that we need to give him time, to, to give him the benefit of the doubt to see uh, what's going to happen in our country, and I wanna say today there can be no doubt. We've seen the video where he brags about sexual assault. There can be no doubt. He's said racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, uh, Islamophobic comments over and over again, and today is the day to initiate the resistance. Um, and there was no better uh, example of why we need to build this resistance than at my son's own elementary school the day after the election. Because that day, there was a young Muslim girl who came to class and hadn't yet found out who won the election, and she found out at school. And she dropped to the ground when she heard the news in tears, pounding her fists into the ground. She was terrified at what could happen to her or her family being possibly being split apart or violence being visited on them. And what happened next, though, I think is an example of where we need to go because my son's teacher didn't let her just suffer alone in, in silence and fear. She gathered all the classes together at that grade level and she held a forum right then and there, impromptu, to tell those kids that they won't suffer alone, that this is a safe place for you, regardless of your background, that she would be there to help protect them. And she did it wearing this shirt, right, that says Black Lives Matter. And uh, the hashtag, say her name, 
to highlight the violence, the state violence against women that's happening across this country that often goes unnoticed um, or unchecked. Um, and she was able to wear this shirt because earlier in the year we had organized a Black Lives Matter at school day where 3,000 teachers wore these shirts to school in a mass demonstration of solidarity uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement and, and our, our black students. And it, it's that kind of initiative inside the schools, right? Bringing together students and teachers that I think we need to see more of. And we need to transform our schools into sites of resistance to everything Trump stands for, right? Trump emblazons his name on everything he owns, right? The Trump Towers, the Trump Hotels, the Trump Golf Courses, the Trump University. Um, and that's a name that's synonymous with bigotry and sexual assault and hatred. And I think we need to emblazon on everything that, that we own in common on, on the public schools, uh, on our reader boards, right? Black Lives Matter, right? Sanctuary campus, immigrants are welcome here, right? Uh, LGBTQ families are welcome here. Um, and this is the type of uh, resistance that I wanna help build um, across Seattle and across this country. Uh, and it's one that has a long tradition, right? And I wanna talk about some of that history today. Um, and I'm so grateful for the work of Dr. Martin Luther King that, that gives us a platform, a way to come together today, um, and many lessons that I wanna uh, pull, pull from today. And uh, he wrote a book in 1967 called Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? right, the year before he was assassinated. And you really have to read this book because in it he pens a polemic for what he calls phase two of the movement, right? So by the time King was writing this book, they had won the legal formal rights, right? They had struck down the Jim Crow laws. They had won the Voting Rights Act, right? Now black people could sit where they wanted to. They could go into the restaurant and sit anywhere they wanted. But the problem was, it doesn't mean they had enough money to buy the food, right? So phase two of the movement had to include uh, strong economic demands, right? Um, and so he says um, phase two has to challenge economic inequality. And he says, Dignity is also uh, corroded by poverty. No worker can maintain his morale or sustain his spirit if, the marketplace, uh, if in the marketplace his capacities are declared to be worthless to society. And he compared the cost of creating real equality, uh, the civil rights movement, he said that the civil rights movement victories were cheap to America. It didn't cost them much, right? We need to fight farther than that uh, for for real gains. He said, the practical cost of change for the nation up to this point has been cheap. The limited reforms have been obtained at bargain rates. The real cost lies ahead. The stiffening of white resistance in recognition of that fact. And he says, the discount education that Negroes will in the future uh, have to be purchased at full price if a quality education is to be realized. And he famously said that the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the real goal of education, right? And so that's the fight we're, we're in today, still, to fully fund our education system, right? They can't do it on the cheap. Uh, we know in this state, <laughs> in Washington state, we, are, we have the most regressive tax structure of all 50 states. So that means rich people pay the less. Why do you think we have Amazon, Boeing, Microsoft, Starbucks, Bill Gates, right? The richest people in the world. And they live here and they don't pay their fair share. And what happens is our children suffer because of it. And the state Supreme Court has ruled that the state legislature is in violation of the Constitution. Our state constitution says it's the paramount duty to fully fund and provide for education. And our state legislature is just continuing to neglect the law, 
right? Uh, and they refuse to fund education, and instead they give away huge tax breaks to the wealthiest corporations, right? So that, that's the state that, uh, that we live in. Um, and that, those funding priorities, refusing to follow the law and giving away money to the rich, uh, has real consequences in my classroom and in classrooms across this state. And it's part of uh, what is known as the school to prison pipeline, right? Um, and I think the school to prison pipeline is consciously being constructed uh, very, and it's very easy to see how it, it is being constructed um, in this city and across the country. And I want to raise a few examples for you today to give you a sense of, of what this pipeline looks like. And I think it begins right in the classroom, right in the curriculum. And the, the most vivid example I can give you is, is what happened to a young student named Kobe Burren last year. Um, at his school in Texas. He opened up his, his textbook to the page the teacher assigned, and he's reading the passage on uh, Europe and Africa and uh, the slave triangle. And he notices, though, that the word slave is missing from this arrangement and instead has been replaced with the word worker. So workers were brought from Africa to work in America. Um, they did point out that indentured servants from Europe were brought over and into forced unpaid labor. But when it came to the African slaves, the word worker was used, giving the impression that they had come here looking for a better life, <laughs> right? So Kobe takes out his cell phone and takes a little picture of that and texts it to his mom. He says, Mom, we was real good workers, wasn't we? And his mom was getting her PhD in history. And she didn't take too kindly to this. She got on Facebook and opened up the textbook, did a little Facebook video walking you through who all the PhDs were that signed their name off on this book, right, that had reviewed this material. And not just that they had replaced the word worker uh, for slave, right? It's that they put the chapter on slavery in the section of the book on immigration, as if people, black people were just traveling here looking for a better life, right? So thankfully, because of that resistance, because of a mass letter writing campaign, and a viral video from his mother, the textbook company, the largest textbook company in the United States had to issue an apology and had to retract uh, that book and, and begin to replace um, the, at least the word, right? They have a problem with the whole section being, they, that's harder to do. Uh, so the, the fight has to continue. I wanna talk about also a girl in Ohio excuse me, a young 12-year-old boy in Ohio who was in a staring contest with a girl. And he was pulled out of class and he was suspended because he, it was said that he was intimidating her. Right? And so then it went beyond the school. He appealed it, but it went all the way to the Ohio courts and the courts upheld the suspension, saying that the girl felt fearful, even though this young boy wrote, wrote an apology to her, and he said, quote, I never knew she was scared because she was laughing. I understand I done wrong. This thing will never happen again. I will start to think before I do these types of things in this situation. Can you imagine the humiliation of a young boy who did nothing wrong having to write an apology letter and then be reprimanded anyway for it, right? Or we can talk about a young girl of a video you may have seen, a very disturbing video from South Carolina 
where she's ripped out of her desk and thrown across the classroom by a police officer. Uh, and then she's charged uh, with disruption uh, of the class, right? I think that all these examples highlight different aspects of how the school to prison pipeline is built. It starts with a curriculum that doesn't reflect our youth, that hides the truth about our struggles and contributions, and then kids check out. Uh, be, and a lot of people call that disobedience when the kids check out, but I think it probably is better understood as resistance to a racist curriculum, right? And then when they check out, we have zero tolerance discipline policies and officers there ready to rip them out uh, and, or suspend them, and then they're less likely to graduate when they, sus when they fall behind in their work and they're suspended, right? And then they're less likely to have that diploma and less likely to get a job and far more likely to end up incarcerated. And we know that the high stakes testing regime that's been put in place in this country is only fueling that problem uh, because recent studies show that exit exams, the only outcome of, of attaching high stakes to graduation requirements has been increased incarceration rates as uh, kids are routinely denied their diploma based on one test score, even if they've done, uh, their teachers say they are ready to graduate and they're ready to, to go on. Right? And in Seattle, the school to prison pipeline has been laid totally bare in the, in the last few months, completely exposed because in the Seattle public schools, we have a $74 million budget shortfall for the schools, and yet somehow politicians in our county have found $200 million to build a new youth jail, right? So we're getting, we're depriving them of the resources they need to be successful on the front end, and then we're investing hundreds of millions of dollars in locking up our kids. That's the, the plan that these politicians have ready for the kids in my classroom, and that's why we have to fight back. And so I think, really, it's the contradictions of what's promised in public education and what's actually delivered that makes campuses and schools such explosive sites of struggle. And I think it's why the struggle for black education has always been a major part of the black freedom struggle. Uh, right? So much is promised with education. It's going to be the great equalizer. If you just work hard, put your nose to the grind, right, and do your homework, you can get ahead, right? Except for if you're black or brown, except for if you're living in poverty. At Garfield High School, we have 150 homeless students, right? In a state dripping with this much wealth, that's an outrage. And how are you going to do homework if you don't even have a home, right? So. There's so much promised, and yet the reality has been so different from the very beginning of public education that that contradiction has created massive upheavals in, in public schools and in college campuses throughout time uh, and throughout our country. I think you know, the first organized effort of, of black people to, to fight back uh, using education, I think you have to start during slavery, when it was illegal to be literate, when it was, uh, when being, if you were caught reading, punishment would be, would be lucky, death uh, would also be a possible outcome, and, and slaves nonetheless resisted and did a thing called stealing a meeting, they called it, when they would sneak off and teach each other to read and write um, as a basic form of resistance because you could forge a traveling pass and escape, right? Um, I think that you have to look at how the public schools actually started in this country after Reconstruction, right? When the South lost the Civil War um, and there's actually a period of Reconstruction in the South where you have integrated schools of black and white students, poor black and white students, 
and black people uh, taking the lead in outpouring uh, of building new schools and demanding literacy as part of the struggle for freedom. And actually, my, my grandparents toured the South um, throughout the uh, Jim Crow era building schools and um, seeing that as a key contribution to the, the black freedom struggle. And then you have the Brown versus Board of Education decision to desegregate um, schools, and you have courageous young people um, like Ruby Bridges uh, going in and, and integrating schools despite white mobs uh, spitting and hurling uh, insults. And you have an incredible legacy of the Freedom Schools, incredible educators like Septima Clark, who used uh, really innovative dialogic pedagogy um, methodology to, to teach um, formerly illiterate African Americans um, to empower them, um, and to, to not just teach literacy, but to teach it through civic action, right, and collective organizing. And then the black power movement um, is often thought of as just the urban rebellions and, and the riots, but I think that you have to look at the way the black power movement transformed education. Um, you know, the Black Panther Party got started from a study group um, at Merritt College, right? You have to look at the way the black power movement entered the college campuses with one of the main demands being black studies. We want the right to learn about our own culture and history and people um, and the way that people had to sacrifice just to get a basic education of themselves. You know, at, at the University of Washington in 1968 when the Black Student Union was founded there uh, with Larry Gossett and and um, the founder of the Black Panther Party of Seattle, Aaron Dixon, um, there wasn't a single book written by any African American used anywhere on the campus, right? And so they held massive demonstrations to have a black studies department um, and even receive solidarity from white student radicals um, and groups like Students for Democratic Society, SDS, um, and they had to fight uh, and win those, those black studies department. My dad was at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, you know Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968. That following fall, they had huge demonstrations to demand a black studies department. They had to bring in the National Guard to try to quell the student protesters. Um, but at the end of it, they finally were able to win the black studies department. And these are just a little taste of the type of explosions that have happened throughout history in the struggle uh, for education. And I think today, given this overt bigot that we have being coronated today uh, in the White House, uh, we are poised to see a new round of explosion for civil rights, for human rights, um, on college campuses and in schools uh, across the country. Uh, we, we need it more, more than ever. And I'm really proud uh, of my colleagues in the Seattle Public Schools who have begun to organize uh, along, along these lines. And you can see some of them here in these photos. I wanna talk about what this Black Lives Matter at School Day was and uh, what it started and where we're going with this movement. And um, I want to talk a little bit about how we can uh, build this movement broadly and use it to, to really confront not only Trump, but the, the ingrained institutional and structural racism, sexism, and homophobia uh, of our society um, and, and create a much much better education system and a much better world. And I think some of the, the work that my colleagues uh, have done in the last few months this year is really inspirational and I hope gives you guys some ideas for how to fight back. Um, this movement for Black Lives Matter at school 
really started with John Muir Elementary School in Seattle. Um, there's a group called Black Men United to Change the Narrative, and they were organizing to have a day where you bring in black community members out front of the school and you celebrate the, the black uh, community at that school. So they were high-fiving all the kids as they came into school. They are going to have a big assembly and rally um, to celebrate black achievement. And the teachers at John Muir wanted to support this effort. And so the art teacher actually designed the, um, the shirts that they were going to wear. And they said, Black Lives Matter, we stand together. Well, the media got a hold of this, found out that teachers were going to wear Black Lives Matter shirts. And then it went to a group called Blue Lives Matter, right, to support police officers. And then the hate mail started flooding in to John Muir Elementary, right? And then some hateful person went as far as issuing a bomb threat to the school and saying, if, if you uh, show up to school in these shirts, this, this is uh, the violence we will visit upon your school. So the school district had to formally cancel the Black Lives uh, event there. But the teachers and community members, to their credit, uh, went ahead and did it anyway. And it was smaller than it would have been without the, the threat of violence. But they still held their, their event. And it was an inspiration to teachers across Seattle. And I said, we have to figure out a way to support them and to let them know that we see their courage. So I invited them to a planning meeting of the social equality educators, the, the social justice caucus of teachers in, in the teachers union in Seattle. And they came and shared their story. And we decided to bring a resolution to the broader teachers union that represents you know, some 5,000 educators in Seattle. And we made the case that every teacher should wear a shirt that says Black Lives Matter. We'll pick a day. And they can't threaten every school in Seattle. We'll all stand together. Well, I figured maybe a couple dozen of us hardcore activists would wear the Black Lives Matter shirt. And I was shocked when first the resolution passed unanimously, and then the orders for the shirts just started going through the roof. It became a full-time job driving shirts around. Oh, there's a school up north that needs an extra large. It became, it became a huge project. Um, but it was absolutely breathtaking the day of. And you can see just a smattering of some of the schools that, that participated here. Um, the elementary schools, the middle schools, the high schools. Um, there's my school, Garfield. Uh, right on, Bulldogs. <laughs> All right, we got a couple of y'all. Um, and you can see, um, you know, over 3,000 teachers put these shirts on. But it wasn't just about wearing the shirt. Hundreds of teachers, many hundreds of teachers, taught lessons about structural racism in their class that day or showed the movie 13th, right? Um, there were families that just began organizing, getting materials, setting up um, tables out front of the schools with, with information about how to talk to your kids about race. We had an evening rally that was packed to the rafters with um, community members and families from all over Seattle to come um, hear from our black youth and uh, see their talents of tap dancing and poetry and music um, and, and speeches, and it really uh, was an, an incredible rebuke of everything that the hateful right wing had, had been trying to, to shut our movement down with. They said, they said, don't politicize the classroom, right? And you can't, you can't wear those shirts into the classroom and, and bring uh, politics into the classroom. And I say, tell that to Michael Brown's mom. Tell that to Rakia Boyd's mom or Sandra Bland's mother, right? Uh, to say this, our black students' lives matter is a basic declaration of humanity. Um, and we saw the power of what that could do because now 
uh, starting on Monday, there is going to be a whole week of Black Lives Matter at school in the Philadelphia public schools, and now we see it spread across the nation, and I think that's just going to be the start of a new phase of the Black Lives Matter movement entering the, the public schools. I'm really excited about the way uh, this movement is, is developing. And I think that um, what student radicals and radicals of all times during the last major uh, social upheavals of the 60s and 70s learned, we're, we're going to start learning uh, again today. And I want to share uh, some of those lessons, and, and then I want to um, take some time to uh, have some uh, interaction with you all and get questions and figure out um, what, what ways we can, we can uh, support you to organize right here. But what student radicals, I think, learned in the last social upheavals was that the, the struggle would often explode on campuses, but to make truly lasting and impactful and structural change, it had to go far beyond the campus itself. The struggles for racial justice, against war, for women's liberation, for gay liberation, none of those fights could be won without linking them to one another and to actually beginning to examine the economic structure that we live under, the, the very foundations of capitalism that are built around inequality, division, and oppressions of all kinds. And so literally millions of students drew the conclusion that we had to have a, a revolution in this country to overturn those who are in power. And a lot of times we talk about how we, cont we contrast Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and we see uh, Malcolm X as the revolutionary who wanted to uh, build a, a whole different society um, by any means necessary, and we look at Dr. Martin Luther King as, uh, as someone who was merely peaceful and um, wanted slower change, right? And you, you see lots of quotes you know, important quotes from Malcolm X, things like, you can't have capitalism without racism. And we see the, the, um, the militancy of Malcolm X that was so important to, the, to those movements. Um, but I, um, I want to suggest that there's far more overlap between these two leaders, especially uh, in the ends of their lives, towards the ends of their lives. And I want to draw some, some lessons from these two leaders to, to help guide our way as we enter what uh, Trump has planned to be a very uh, scary, dark era, and what many of us have a whole different uh, vision based in um, where I think Martin Luther King and Malcolm X were, were uh, really going towards the end of their lives. So I want to look at a couple of quotes from these leaders and um, towards the end of their lives. Because Malcolm X said, it's impossible for a white person to believe in capitalism and not believe in racism. You can't have capitalism without racism. And if you find one and you happen to get a person in a conversation and they don't have a philosophy that makes sure, uh, and, they, and they have a philosophy that makes you sure they don't have this racism in their outlook, they're usually socialists or their political philosophy is socialism, right? Now, Dr. King had this to say. You don't usually hear this on Martin Luther King Day, right? We get the endless repetition of the I have a dream speech on loop, and they try to freeze him in 1963 as if his ideas had never developed beyond that. But if you start to look at the direction he's going, uh, you'll see that he is coming much more closer together with the direction that, that Malcolm X was going at the end of his life. He says, quote, capitalism does not permit an even flow of economic resources. With this system, a small privileged few are rich beyond conscience, and almost all others are doomed to be poor at some level. That's the way the system works. And since we know that the system will not change the rules, we are going to have to change the system. 
He said, you can't talk about solving an economic problem of the Negro without talking about billions of dollars. You can't talk about ending the slums without first saying profits must be taken out of the slums. You're really tampering and getting on dangerous ground because you are messing with folk then. You are messing with the captains of industry. Now this means that we are treading in difficult water because it, is, it really means that we are saying that something is wrong with capitalism. There must be a better distribution of wealth and maybe America must move towards democratic socialism, right? That's where Martin Luther King was going and towards a whole analysis of the structure of our society, uh, confronting all forms of oppression and seeing how they were rooted in a system of basic inequality. And today, that system uh, is more, more obvious, I think, than ever. A new study came out. Did you all see this about wealth distribution in the world? You, last year, 62 people had the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the world. This year, the richest eight people have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion people on the planet. Right? That is an obscenity that leads to all a myriad of other problems that we face and struggles that we face, whether it's health care, housing, uh, education. Um, that fundamental inequality is driving so many other problems. We have immense challenges in our world today. We have a mass incarceration system that means that more black people are behind bars or on probation or parole than were slaves on plantations in 1850. Think about that. We have just locked away, right, uh, and torn apart so many families, and not just African American families, Latino families. Even under President Obama, he split apart more families than any president in the history of our country, right? With, uh, with these immigration raids and deportations, right? We have an epidemic of sexual assault in our country where one in four women report having faced sexual assault. And it goes so unchecked on college campuses, often um, just swept under the rug. And then, you know, we, we just see the proliferation of objectification of women in the media that leads to these sexual assaults. We have endless wars that our country is perpetrating, mostly on brown people, Muslim people around the world. We are investing trillions of dollars to go bomb people and children in the Middle East, and we can't find the money to lower the class size right here in Washington State, right? And I think perhaps the greatest challenge we face as a community, as a country, as a world, is climate change. Because scientists tell us that if the temperature increases by three degrees globally, that it could trigger runaway climate change that is irreversible, that would make human life on this planet impossible and would end civilization as we know it. And yet, our country gives massive tax breaks to fossil fuel companies that are destroying the possibility of human civilization, right? These, these are the real high stakes that we face, not, not these uh, ABCD bubble test questions that we ask the kids to endlessly take in schools. We need to develop a whole different education system that trains our kids to be critical thinkers to challenge these real problems that we face in our society, not just eliminate wrong answer choices endlessly, right, but to learn how to cooperate with one another. We need an education system that develops imagination and critical thinking and civic courage and collaboration to be able to, to 
begin to organize together and to figure out how to collectively act so that we can challenge uh, all of these problems, uh, beginning with this president, but going far beyond replacing a president with a new one to actually fundamentally challenge the inequity and the structural uh, barriers in, in our society. So I want to thank everyone for, for having me here today, and I look forward to, to hearing your questions. Thanks so much. that you want to ask. Um, we've got two microphones right here. Feel free to come on up to the microphone. I know folks are going to have to leave. Some of you have to leave for class in about five minutes. So feel free to do that when you need to. Just be mindful of the noise that the chairs make when you're heading out um, to not disrupt the conversation too much. But now's a great time. Bring your questions. Come down to the mic. And it's an opportunity to interact and, and have a conversation with Jesse. Um, it's not a question, it's more of a thank you. Um, a lot of people in this room may know I am the Black Student Union President on campus. Um, but more so, thank you. But more so, wanted to give a special thank you to my high school BSU advisor, who is Jesse Gopian, as well as our speaker for today. <laughs> it's so good to see you here, continuing the work. That's a really beautiful thing. Thank you so much, and good luck with all you're doing. And we need to figure out ways to get our students collaborating um, and building uh, the resistance you know, from college to high school. Um, and uh, I look forward to that work with you. Right on. I know some of y'all have to leave for next class, but. For me, it's also a thank you because you are an example that we have to start thinking on doing. For those who are not finding the brave um, in your heart to do things like you are doing, we have to start supporting each other who are able to speak up. Thank you because all the work that you are doing are an example. As a Latino student, I would like to know more about it, how to get organized my community, because all the results that you as a black movement are having are impacting us directly, because we are suffering not too much as you, but we are suffering too. Yeah. And I would like to, to ask you, how do you promote um, this unity between your parents in your school? because our high schools and other levels are uh, suffering because they don't know how to call parents in order to be united with the teachers and getting respect for our own communities. Mm -hmm. And again, thank you for what you are doing. Right on, thank you. That's a great question. I mean, unity is, that's the way we can win, right? Because their advantage is they have all the money but they have very few people. And our advantage is we have a lot more people, but the only way we can press that advantage is if we can overcome the divisions that they have set up, right? They divide us based on nationality or on race or on sexual orientation, and they try to convince us that our enemies are right, each other around us, because otherwise they're only 1%. There's so few of them that we would just take over our schools and, and our communities and our workplaces and run them for ourselves instead of for making them, them wealthy. So figuring out the concrete details of how we build unity in our school um, is really a, a great place to start. Um, one initiative that we have in the Seattle Public Schools that we just launched is a fight for ethnic studies. There's so much research that shows that Ethnic studies dramatically improves educational outcomes for, for students, especially students of color. But it's not just the, the academic outcomes, it's also the empowerment that they get to change their society when they know the history of their struggles and their community. And I think fighting for ethnic studies programs um, can be a way to bring communities together. 
you know, we were inspired to do this by the fight of the Latino uh, families in Arizona. Because in Arizona, those bigots down there banned ethnic studies, the, specifically the Mexican American Studies program. And some courageous teachers and parents and students fought hard to try to keep the program to allow Mexican students to learn about their culture. And there's an amazing film, if you haven't seen Precious Knowledge, uh, you really have to watch this film about that struggle. Um, and so we want to, uh, we, ha we have a petition going. It's, you know, the teachers in Seattle along with the NAACP have a, have a petition to demand ethnic studies programs. And I think that that's a great way to bring together um, families of many different backgrounds to demand that our kids be able to have African American um, Pro, uh, studies and gender studies programs and Latino study programs and you know um, all kinds of, of um, programs like that and I'll just end by saying that when any one group moves into action it often helps inspire and encourage others and so to me it, it's not so much about like who's uh, the most oppressed or who's suffering the most but how can we all link our struggles together because we only get free if all of us get free, right? And so it's about, um, you know, during the Black Power era, um, the Black Power movement rose up, but look at what it brought with it. The American Indian movement, right? The Gay Liberation Front rose up. Um, you have the huge anti-war movement on campuses uh, against the Vietnam War movement that all learn from the civil rights and black power movement how to collectively organize and challenge power. And I want to see that same dynamic. So I want to see how the Black, the black Lives Matter movement uh, moves forward, how the, the courageous people at Standing Rock who fought to protect our water and their land rights um, is now inspiring others across the country. And I can see how we could soon be coming to an era where one struggle inspires the next and we begin to link those struggles together like Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party in Chicago wanted in, in the Rainbow Coalition, right, uh, of different groups fighting for, for the same cause. So, thank you. Hi. I'm Chancellor. I'm part of the Moja program. Oh, here, great. Here at Highland. Um, I'm studying to be a paraeducator. Wonderful. And, um, also, um, probably go towards a get a BA in teaching. And um, as you being a teacher, um, I want I want to be able to be that as well and be a part of a kid's journey and getting their education. Um, I noticed that. Um, that kids that are a little sl slower in um, learning things are given different work than what other kids that are in regular classes are getting. Mm. And, um, and um, I, I was in special ed as well, and I found, found it like kind of really confusing to why Am I looking at their work and I'm like completely confused? And it's, why can't we all be taught and learn the same thing so we can all grow together? And um, my question is how can I, when I do, when I graduate from college, how can I make that change? Yeah. No, that's a great question, and, th and thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that when I was in school, I had a learning disability that went um, undiagnosed, and it was difficult. Um, I had lots of challenges and hated school, and was often found it very humiliating. Um, and so I definitely think that there's an important role for uh, differentiating instruction in certain ways uh, in the classroom. But the, the biggest problem I see in our schools is 
this rigid tracking system that separates kids um, onto different tracks, the low track or the high track, right? And those tracks, people should know, have nothing to do with intelligence, have nothing to do with ability, right? For a long time, I, I was convinced that I was not intelligent. Um, I had the proof in my test scores, and I could show you why I wouldn't really amount to much. Um, and I was in the, mostly the lower track classes. But what I came to find out when I eventually was able to take courses that mattered to me, that were talking about challenging forms of oppression and seemed to help explain struggles that I had been through, then I started to excel, right? Um, and so we have another initiative we're working on in the Seattle Public Schools to detrack our schools. Um, because we know really what the tracks measure is not intelligence, but your wealth <laughs> and your, your proximity to the dominant culture and mostly uh, white middle class society, right? And so um, the tracks are built for segregation. That's the main purpose, to rank and sort our youth, to sort this stratum of youth into becoming owners and managers, right? To, rent, to sort this track of youth to become uh, low-wage workers and to sort this track of youth directly into the prisons, right? And we are working to tear down those tracks. At Garfield High School this year, we got rid of um, the honors and general ed in ninth grade and put them together. We have honors for all now, right? And there's role for differentiating instruction within the classroom based on different ability levels uh, in, in very specific ways, but segregating and separating our kids really has no place in, the public, in a public school system that, thank you. <laughs> so, I don't know. I got it, JB. Go right on. Um, my name is Liz Bird, and I'm the coordinator for the Emoja Scholars Program here at Highline. Wonderful. And um, Mackenzie left, but she's one of our students as well with the BSU. Um, in Emoja, one of our principles is the ethic of love um, in the effective, effective domain. When practitioners move with an ethic of love, they touch their students' spirits. Moving with an ethic of love means having a willingness to share ourselves, our stories, our lives, our experiences, to humanize and make real the classroom. This leveraging of the effective emotion, trust, hope, trauma, healing, moves the discourse deliberately as an inroad to the cognitive domain. Approaching one's practice with an ethic of love implies a holistic approach, body, mind, and spirit. Can you talk to us how you implement the ethic of love in your classrooms? Yeah, that, that's beautiful. I love that. I and, tweeted it to you. Oh, great. Excellent. <laughs> No, I, I, want, I want those words so I can, I can use that. I, I completely believe that. Um, you know, we have to have a, a loving, caring um, classroom in order to, to educate. Kids have to know that you care about them before you can teach them anything. Um, you know, the story I started off with, with my son's teacher gathering the, the kids together and telling them this is a safe place for you, she can't teach th those, those kids, uh, mostly immigrant um, families, anything until they know they're safe and they're loved there, right? Um, in my classroom, before I teach anything about history, we have our first unit is called Who Am I? What is history? What does history have to do with me? And that, that unit is about figuring out who my students are as people, what they care about, what they believe in, what their identities are, and having their, the, the students explore their identities, um, learning concepts about intersectionality, um, how to support each other for who we truly are and what we believe in. And that's the foundation once, once they can uh, begin to answer the question, who am I, then we, we connect it to uh, how history relates to their own lives, what historical forces have gone into shaping their identity. Um, and then, only then, once they can 
they can answer those questions, can we begin to, to actually get into the curriculum? Because now they can see how it relates to their own lives. And now we've built a community of learners where we care about each other. Um, and when it's working well, that's the, the only way to learn. And that's what I was missing. That's why I, I never connected to school, because I couldn't answer those questions. And no one ever asked them, right? And so that's where I try to take uh, my, my pedagogy. But, but thank you for that. Um, hi, my name is Jonathan. Um, I work in our student activity center on campus. Right on. I think when I heard you say that you were your BSU's advisor at Garfield, I really felt compelled to say thank you. Um, I, and I also just think there's something ironic about you being here. Um, we had other opportunities for major speakers to listen to as a crowd right now because you're talking at the exact same time as the inaugural <laughs> yep. address and I'm, I'm pretty sure I've learned more from you <laughs> during this time than I would if I was Bravo. watching TV. Um, I am inspired by the, the leadership pipeline that I saw between you and Mackenzie and her being here and being a leader. and and you know, to contrast what I'm gonna hear later when I watch this address, mm. I'm interested in um, some of the, that hope. And specifically, um, looking at that as a leadership pipeline, as you develop student leaders in, in high schools and you're sending them forward, please continue to send yeah. them to Highline because yes. this is where we need <laughs> Good them, idea. right? You know? Could, what are your hopes for the things that you want to see the students that you're moving forward into their colleges doing? Maybe your top two things that, that you feel like all would be right in the world if my future students at college were doing this and this. Yeah. So no, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And uh, it's, it's just so grat The most gratifying thing of this work is seeing the student leaders continuing the work. Um, so that really is important. I mean, to me, it's what I want to see them do is what they feel like they need to do, right? So I want to see them act collectively. I want to see them work together to unite um, different forces in the students together around the issues they care the, mo the most about, right? I think they're the. I would imagine that some of the struggles that we're going to see in the coming months uh, that will be organized collectively around are going to be around police violence because they're going unabated and unchecked and we never know when the next video we're going to see of some horrific murder um, by someone who will never be held accountable will be and that um, needs to stop, that needs to change and needs to be confronted and I think College campuses are likely to be the sites of resistance uh, to, to bring students together on those issues. I would think that um, tuition is something when college is so prohibitively expensive and we want to diversify and bring in more people, that that's an issue that I think students are likely to organize around. But, you know, with this new maniac in the White House, um, we're going to have plenty of issues to fight around, right? Um, if he begins talking about deportations, we need to start building our sanctuary campuses. We need to open our homes to refugees, right? We're going to have to figure out new forms of resistance. Um, if we're talking about internment camps, like one of his advisors um, flippantly said might be appropriate for Muslims, then we're going to have to build uh, mass resistance, right? And so uh, I'm just hopeful that students will take that and fight around the things that they care most about and that are, that are impacting them. Hi, Jesse. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. My oh, name is Doris, you. and I'm chair of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Week. Thank you so much. Um, my question to you, um, Betsy DeVoe, she is um, Trump's nominee for Secretary of Education. And um, I don't know if some of you or most of you may have seen the YouTube videos um, in regards to um, 
uh, Elizabeth Warren definitely grilling her um, in regards to what she knows. Um, this is a multi-trillion dollar budget that she would be in charge of, um, and she doesn't really know much. Yeah. Um, as an educator, and for many educators that are here in this room today, what can we do to prepare? Because if this woman, um, which I'm pretty sure, will be the Secretary of Education for the next four years, um, it seems frightening. So what can we do to start? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thanks for organizing this whole week of action. Um, this is how, no doubt. Yeah, to, to all the committee. Um, yeah, Betsy DeVos is a train wreck of a Secretary of Education. Um, I want to say a, a few things on that and talk, try to highlight a few of her initiatives. I also have a music video that some black students made in Baltimore that I think get at some of the key inequities in public education that maybe we can, we can end on to look at um, resistance that's going. Um, but, you know, it didn't, you, you talked about how she was grilled on that. It didn't take much to grill her. Like, <laughs> you could ask her, like, what's a school? And she, like, had to pause for a while, and th right? Or, I mean, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't take much to grill her because she has no experience at all with public education, right? And in fact, that makes her more qualified in the eyes of the elite. The less experience she has, the better, because the idea is not to support public education. The idea is to uh, privatize and erode public education. So she never went to public schools. Of course, none of her kids go to public schools. She never taught, right? the less experience, the better. The only experience with public schools she has is running foundations working on privatizing the schools, right? Um, or her family foundation that invests in um, gay conversion therapy, um, right? And this is someone who's supposed to be nurturing all of our kids, right? Um, and then she said it was a clerical error that she had been listed as vice president of this foundation. Uh, for, what, 14 years in a row? That's a massive clerical error. Um, it's, really, it's really a joke. The, the thing that's disheartening to me, though, is that as crazy as she is, as, as, as out of touch as she is with public education, she, really the groundwork for this was laid by the previous education secretary, Arne Duncan, who also had no experience in public schools, who was also interested in privatizing with a much, with, with, a, with a smile, with, you know, he's not going to be in your face being a, a bigot at all, right? But flowing money towards um, charter schools and away from uh, public schools has laid the groundwork and put in place the situation that we could be in right now. And I'll just end on this by saying that um, you know, they want to continue their project of reducing public education, um, the intellectual process of teaching and learning, the emotional process of teaching and learning to a single score, right? So promoting high-stakes testing, and then um, once they've done that, then they want to punish you based on that score so they can close down schools that they label failing on those scores. Right? Rather than bring resources to them, lower class sizes, get more counselors, right? they want to just shut those schools down or deny the kids graduation based on the score. Um, and then once they've labeled the, score, the school failing based on these test scores, then they can convert them to charter schools to be run by private entities. Right? So this is their project that they want to roll out. In New Orleans, after the storm, they had a huge gift uh, because now the, the schools were in such disarray. Arne Duncan said Hurricane Katrina was the best thing that ever happened to the New Orleans public school system. A really disgusting comment because now they could come in and redo them as, as charter schools and now there's I think five public schools left in New Orleans, right? And the rest are charter schools. So um, this is what they want to now roll out across the country uh, for public education and what they will try to do um, 
without resistance. But I'm proud to say that we are in the midst of the largest uprising against high stakes testing in US history. Never before have more students refused to take the exams, parents opted their kids out, or teachers like at Garfield High School just refused to give the test altogether. Um, and and the, what was an incredible boycott of the MAP test and, and uh, ended with, you know, the superintendent of the Seattle schools threatened the teachers at Garfield with a 10-day suspension without pay for refusing to give the MAP test. And we said, we won't give it. It's, it's not giving us any information we need. They already take a myriad of other standardized tests. Um, the average public school student in America takes 112 standardized tests, right? It's become a multi-billion dollar industry. It's not about understanding what our kids know. It's about lining the pockets of the Pearson Testing Corporation. And we won't continue to administer this test anymore. We were threatened with the 10-day suspension without pay. My colleagues in the tested subjects of math and reading didn't back down. Not a single one of them administered the test, and we got so much overwhelming solidarity from not only our own PTA and student body government, but thousands of letters of support from around the country that by the end of the school year, the superintendent, not only did he not suspend anyone, he actually got rid of the MAP test altogether for Seattle uh, Public High Schools. So as scary as Betsy DeVos is, what matters is the size of our resistance, right? And are people willing to boycott and strike and walk out? Um, not not uh, how scary they are, but how ready we are to, to resist. So I'm not sure who, who was next. Hi, so my name is Abdul. I'm a student here. So I have like an issue happening in high school as a Muslim and there was a girl, she was like going to pray. And like before we pray, like, we have to like wash your hands, like it was called wudu. And there was an, as an like American girl in the bathroom. And the American girl, she saw her and she threw the hijab, like the, you covered your hair with, hmm. into the bathroom. And the Muslim girl, she come out like without no hijab and I give her my jacket to cover her hair. Mm. And she was scared to like, to tell even the teacher. I was like, why are you scared? There's nothing to be scared of. And I stood up and I go call the, like, the office and the security. I was like, you guys have to look at, into this like, problem. And they spent her for like three days. And she came back and did another problem, another fight. I was like about to graduate. And I saw the fight. Like, they, like, there was like a lot of people around and they're just like taking videos and stuff and nobody touches, tried to stop it. But when I got in, like a different girl, she tried to like hit me. I was like, what are you doing? I'm just trying to break a fight. And she tried to like spam me for like, if you like, you're graduating, like you cannot like do in a fight or something. And she like, oh, we're gonna spend you and send you home and you're not gonna graduate. I, and like the office, he's like, oh, you have to make a report. I was like, I'm not gonna make a report. Just go watch the camera, and I just walk out. Mm. Thank you for sharing that story. It's, it's hard to even hear. Um, you know, the proliferation of hate crimes that have happened since Trump was elected is really scary. Um, you know, this had been happening far before Trump. I think this whole narrative of the war on terror is really about demonizing Arabs and Muslims and has nothing to do with safety. Um, it has to do with justifying a, a bloated military budget and um, justifying endless war on people. And it has to do with dividing us against each other here in this country and making us, instead of being angry and fearful of a 1% who's robbing us all and using the, the wealth of our country to line their pockets, making, trying to make us fearful of our neighbors. And when it visits us in school like that, it's really painful. And we have to build alliances against Islamophobia. So I'm, thank you for sharing that story. So I have another idea. Like, 
But like when, before I come to America, like I read the rules, we get like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and like and so on. But why is Trump not talking about those ideas? Yeah. He's just talking about to build the wall. Yeah. No food stamps. <laughs> That's right. I mean, what this country promises and what this country delivers have always been two different things, right? All men are created equal, this country was founded on. Oh, except for my ancestors who were slaves. I mean, there can't be a bigger contradiction than the founding of this country. Um, and that, that just continues, right? We see over and over again the rhetoric is, is soaring. The rhetoric, the rhetoric is lofty, right? Work hard and you can get ahead, except for when the banks sabotage the economy and uh, the banks destroy based on their own faulty uh, practices and lose all their wealth, then our nation is ready to bail them out at the snap of a fingers. But if you have economic difficulties, too bad. We're getting ready to lock you up, right? So the rhetoric has always been one thing, um, but the ideals of freedom of speech and freedom of religion uh, have been put on the, the lips of politicians when, it, when it's useful to them, but have rarely been, been carried out in practice. And that, that's about building social movements to defend each other uh, and not relying on what, what the politicians have. My name is Clara. I'm 17 years old. I was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona, and I was put into those tracking programs. Mm. Um, my dad is white and my mom is black, and I've been made to feel my entire life like I can't appreciate both sides, like I'm not black enough and I'm too black to hang out with the white mm -hmm. kids. So people always ask me, like why I look sad, and I'm not sad, I'm just frustrated because people preach equality, but they don't actually mean it. And it just, it really bugs me, and I'm glad that you're here because this entire week, people have been talking about how you just have to forgive and stuff, and I don't think that you have to forgive, you have to remember, and you mm. have to use that. And I just, I really appreciate what you're saying because this entire week has been like really difficult for me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I know it's hard. And I'm also mixed race and also have had uh, those kind of struggles, right? Um, and it wasn't until midway through college that I learned that race actually isn't real, right? Racism is very, very real. <laughs> um, but that, that blew my mind that actually in the late 1600s, the first laws in world history were enacted around race, right? That for most of human history, there wasn't this concept of race. There was lots of other divisions based on geography or religion or who was deemed civilized or who was deemed barbarian, right? But, but this this division of race was an invention, and actually a very recent invention. When you look at human history, uh, there was white indentured servants and black African slaves working together in fields in the early 1600s for a long time. And when they rose up collectively together in Bacon's Rebellion and took over the colony of Virginia, the most profitable colony to the crown, they held it for eight months, and they were going to take all the profits from that tobacco and everything that they were raising <clears throat> and have the wealth themselves. And that collective action of black and white laborers together showed uh, the, the, the king that he had to do something. And so that's where the first laws dividing black and white people came from, right? We have to set, because the 99% together are far too powerful. They took over the whole colony, <clears throat> and they had to be suppressed. And what do we do to make sure they never work together again like that? Because we're only 1% of the population. How are we going to control this, this colony if they unite? And so the first laws of racial segregation 
that mandate black people as slaves and white people will get paid, not very much, but enough to make them feel different, enough to separate them, right, and enough to build a division that we're still dealing with today. And so um, I think we have to, to understand the commonality of our, of our struggle that way, and, and Frederick Douglass put it, put it best when explaining slavery. He said they divided both to conquer each, and he meant... They, they were conquering all the poor white people as well who were working for very little, and, but just enough more than the slaves and the, those terrible conditions to never unite together again, right? And so that's the division that we still have to figure out how to overcome uh, to, to fight back. So thank you for sharing that, though. I like how you just uh, brought up Frederick Douglass's uh, name. I like to say one of his quotes, I think I might be saying it wrong, but the best slave is one who thinks he or she is free. And I personally believe that our society, most of us are enslaved mentally through the systems at hand and how we think that we're educated through public schooling and even college courses. I like how you brought up capitalism as well and how it promotes inequality and you were bringing up the 1%. And I think, how do we turn this movement of directing black lives and, and projecting, although police brutality is a very serious issue, how do we raise the bar with classism and how it's affecting the entire population. Right on, man. That's the question to ask right there. Right, that gets to the fundamental of how we are gonna transform our society. I totally agree. Our public school system was born out of a great contradiction. On the one hand, you, had, you know, with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, cities are being formed in this society in the 1700s, um, and masses of people are, leaving the countryside, coming into urban spaces, and they no longer have some of the traditional discipline forces of the family or uh, uh, of the church that were there to um, bring them into society the way uh, they were supposed to be raised. They're coming by the millions into cities, and corporations wanted public school systems as a way to discipline this population, to teach discipline and to get them ready to be workers in their factories. So corporations demanded public schools be set up the way they are, right? With uh, very rigid um, separate classes with the bell system and being on time being the most important aspect of school, right? With following your teacher's demands rather than learning collectively, um, with discipline and suspensions and these form um, being ever present in our schools. Corporations saw public schools as a way to discipline the workforce um, to then go and fill their factories so they could make money off of our kids. At the same time, parents and families saw education as a way uh, to get ahead, as a way to get literacy and as critical to their liberation. And that, there's always been that tension in the public schools of which vision we're gonna have, right? Is it gonna be this public school system as a way to discipline our kids and teach them the dominant narratives of our society, that America has done nothing wrong, that we're the beacon of hope and freedom in the world, um, that, that all those in authority are there because they're right and just, or are schools gonna be a place that teach critical thinking and teach kids a way to question and talk back to authority, right? There's always that tension, and which one prevails is about what we do and how we struggle. And I think the last thing you said about how we, we go from a Black Lives Matter movement that challenges police unaccountability and police terror in our communities to building a class-wide movement of uh, people of, of all backgrounds and colors uniting not just to confront police brutality, but a system that demands police brutality. Because you can't have a system of this type of inequality, how do you maintain eight people having the same amount of wealth as 3.5 billion people? You can't do that without a massive police state, right? 
And so we can begin to challenge that police state, but we gotta look at the fundamental inequality that, that's under, underlying that problem. Um, my name is Seth, I'm with the Emoja Scholars. I'm part of the Emoja program. Right on. Woo, woo, right on. <laughs> uh, when you, you caught my attention when you said vision, it made me think of, um, you know, black people, you know, you know, in urban neighborhoods and whatnot. And I was thinking, like, we talk about police brutality and us being mistreated and us being discriminated, but how do we fix, how do we fix, you know, like, sorry, how I put this? We talk about police brutality, but a lot of the, a, a lot of other brutalities that we face are within each other. You know, we, I see, I grew up uh, some parts and not the best, some parts in the urban communities and I saw, you know, my own black people, you know, fighting each other and, you know, shooting each other, killing each other. So how do we, <clears throat> how do we fix that? How do we, how do we change our vision from the, how we change our vision from, you know, us being the target, each other being the target and each other facing our anger towards each other and and more towards the cause. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've I've um, heard this debate. I think most um, visibly, I saw this question being debated out by the the Seahawks. Did you see Richard Sherman and and Michael Bennett have a debate around the, the question of Black Lives Matter? I was pretty impressed with the with the discussion they had because Sherman did say, you know. You guys are raising Black Lives Matter, but then you're in your own neighborhoods killing each other. Isn't that as bad as what the police are doing? And Michael Bennett disagreed. And I, and I, I um, really valued what Michael Bennett had to, to offer to the discussion because number one, he pointed out, well, when one black person kills another black person, the police will be there quick to deliver justice, right? What they call justice, which is locking you up or, or killing you. There will be a consequence, right? When a police officer kills you, we know there won't be a consequence, or almost never. So that's one fundamental injustice we have to look at. But the larger question is why? Why are we, why, why is there violence in inner cities? Why is there violence in black communities? Is it that you either have to say there's something wrong with black people there's something fundamentally wrong either biologically or with our culture, or you have to say there's something wrong with a nation and a structure and a society that has produced this level of, of inequality, uh, that has produced ghettos. And once you start to, to learn about the history of how our neighborhoods were formed, I think it puts it in a whole di different light. Like what, I, I started teaching in Washington, D.C., one of the most impoverished ghettos in the nation is in southeast in Anacostia there. Where, where did these communities come from? Why is there so much violence there? Well, the, in the 50s after World War II, uh, the Federal Housing Authority constructed massive projects and the Federal Transportation Administration put highways right from the white communities out to the suburbs, right? And they consciously constructed ghettos and concentrated other, right, um, then, then they're called violence or backwards, um, but we have to look at the policies that led to, to the problems, the disinvestment in our communities, the disinvestment in the schools that produce these problems, and instead of just blaming each other for that, look at um, the larger forces that, that are undermining uh, our, our communities and our schools, and, and look to that, I think, as the source of the violence. Uh, my name is Walter Heyman III, and I'm a part of the Moja Black Scholars also. Right on. Um, I'm a direct product of that school-to-prison pipeline, and it's taken me decades to have the courage and the self-confidence to be able to 
relearn who I am, to identify with myself of who I am, to be taught by others of who I am. So all of this has taken time. All of these structural injustices and problems have taken time. And the society that we live in breeds our kids to be that way, to not be self-confident, to think about competition as a better or worse thing right. and not an equity thing. So my question is, is how do we begin to acknowledge the, to acknowledge, I mean to acknowledge differences in our kids and shape their thoughts and feelings around everyone mm. being important and equitable, breaking down the stigma of competitiveness, yeah. making one better than the other. Right on. Yeah. And it, it looks like we're coming up on time, so I don't know if we have time for any more or if we'll make that, that the last question. Okay. Um, first, I got to say that thank you all. This has been really incredible questions. People have shared some really painful experiences today, and this has been a real conversation. So thank you all for your bravery and sharing what you've been through, because then we can uh, use those stories to help fuel our resistance, right? Now we know, we know what we're fighting for from the very questions that people asked in this room today. Um, and breaking down this individualist mentality is really key, right? They want us to think of ourselves as individuals and to have our whole life's pursuit be about bettering ourselves and uh, at the expense of the collective, right? And it's about getting ahead. That's what you hear school is the, the purpose is to get ahead, right? We'll grade you on a curve and there'll be some that that do well and, and will leave the rest behind, right? Um, this is what they, uh, they try to indoctrinate us uh, with. And really, the reason why is because the power of our collective action could transform this world to make it much better for all of us. And so we have to transform our classrooms into being places that, that teach cooperation, right? We have to, we have to look at how um, to structure uh, pedagogy so that our kids are working collectively so that they have a voice in the education process. In, in my classroom, it's not about me just lecturing like I did today, um, but it's actually about posing questions and having them actually uh, have to, to do research to represent different viewpoints um, and figure out what they, what they believe in and what actions would need to be taken to, to solve that problem. And it's about breaking down a high-stakes testing system that's, about, that's designed to rank our kids um, and to pit them against each other uh, rather than teaching them um, that there's many different forms of knowledge, that there's uh, many different ways to be smart, um, and that we need all those forms to come together to collectively solve, solve our problems. Um, and I guess I just want to wrap up by, by saying a, a Howard Zinn quote for today on Inauguration Day, as we enter this, this new um, scary era of a man who's appointed openly white supremacists into his cabinet, of a man who um, has proudly bragged about sexual, sexually assaulting women, um, a, a man that proudly brags about being uh, uh, xenophobic and wanting to build a wall to keep out Mexicans. Uh, it's a very, very scary time for many, many different communities. But I think what, what Howard Zinn says uh, is something that, that drives me forward both in my classroom and in my activism. And he said, what really matters is not who's sitting in the White House, but who's sitting in, in the streets at the lunch counters, right, at the demonstrations. That's always been what's most decisive about what type of society we have, right? We didn't, 
we didn't just end slavery by voting in the right president. Actually, Lincoln uh, was going to allow slavery when he, was, when he was elected. We didn't end Jim Crow segregation by electing the right president and then waiting for them to dismantle the system. It took hundreds and thousands of people, many, mostly actually the youth, we celebrate King today for the incredible legacy that he's left and the, the incredible work he did. But we shouldn't forget the thousands of young people who were part of that. We should especially uh, remember that it was the youth in Birmingham that filled up the jails. We're talking about middle school students and high school students that filled the jails so full they couldn't arrest anyone else, right? Um, and we're thankful for Ella Baker who often gets overlooked in the civil rights movement, who actually argued with Martin Luther King that the students need to be separate and have their own voice and be allowed to have the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with their own coordinating council and come to their own conclusions and that group playing such a decisive role, right? The Vietnam War didn't end in that era because Richard Nixon thought uh, we, shouldn't, we should stop killing people. In, in Asia, the war ended because college campuses became ungovernable, right? Um, and I mean, on and on, every single thing that we have, whether it's the eight hour workday that w used to be 14, right? Or the weekend that we have, it didn't happen because we got a president who said, well, I'm gonna challenge the wealthy and take away some of their profits, right? It happened because in the 1930s, there were the biggest strike waves in U.S. history. There were the sit-down strikes in Flint, Michigan. On my mom's side, uh, my family participated in that. And, right, won us um, union protect, the right to unionize the, and collectively bargain. And every single thing we've ha we, we have today, any rights we have, is not because they were written down in a constitution or um, in a declaration of independence or, or promised by a politician. They were because we fought hard for them uh, and, and won them. In my classroom today, I'm getting ready to go back to Garfield to show my kids the film about how women won the right to vote, to get ready for the Women's March tomorrow, right? Women won the right to vote by, uh, during World War I, organizing and challenging President Wilson out in front of his White House, even when they were told, you can't oppose the president at wartime, you'll be called unpatriotic, right? And they took the, the beatings, they, they had to go on hunger strike in jail, right? They had to organize mass marches and mobilizations to, to win the basic right uh, in this country to vote. It will be the very same today. When Trump comes to talk about building a wall or starting a registry, when, when he unleashes police in our communities and tell them they have uh, the right to brutalize us, when he tries to cut the funds to public education, all of these things will either happen or not depending on how ready we are to collectively organize uh, and fight back and then not just stop him from the worst atrocities but, but really work to build a whole different society built on collaboration um, built on looking out for one another and, and um, redistributing the wealth on, on a mass scale to build real equity in our society. So thanks everyone for having me here today. I really appreciate it.